My name is Shane Immelman and I am the founder and CEO of the Lapdesk company. Lapdesk provides portable lap desks to children in underprivileged areas where they don't have enough desks in schools to obviously learn and it really helps to improve the concentration of the child by at least 80%. There's over 4.2 million learners in South Africa as a whole who are faced with the same shortage of desks in their classrooms. In terms of Lapdesk and the co-sponsorship, we are a for-profit organisation. The sponsors are allowed to sponsor certain things on the Lapdesk. So they can put a social message, an environmental message, and then we also have organisations that can obviously just do pure branding on the Lapdesk. This fits in very perfectly with our strategy as a company. Now, the social need uh, is essentially to address the shortages, and Lapdesk is the only real company at the moment who's addressing that shortage as well as the fact that we're an investment company who has a product that's specifically suited to saving for education. Since launch, we've grown from being able to distribute our product in one province out of nine in South Africa. Now we're internationally in, uh, represented in 12 countries across the continent of Africa. Please take your seats, ladies and gentlemen. We're about to start the Africa session with Tony Alumalu. Please take your seats. a business model that is profitable and sustainable, though it's based on meeting needs. We had one store in 2000, we've now got over 270 outlets. It takes character, it takes patience, perseverance and a vision to build this type of company. Please and take your seats ladies and gentlemen, we have started the next session. And solve problems for the community. Take your seats, please. That is willing we to have take started the next session. A certain objective, and just somebody that really has a passion for change. The greater the entrepreneurial activity index, uh, the greater it is for, for emerging markets, we believe, in terms of uh, moving forward and creating wealth. I like the pioneering aspect of it. You're creating the, the path, you're creating the road, you're going where nobody else has been. Other than looking at the government or uh, looking at other people to create jobs for us, we must create jobs for ourselves. Good morning, everyone. I'm Deirdre Coyle. I am the other co-founder co of All World Network. Thank you so much for being here this morning. I'm sorry we um, the first session were running a little late, but we are very excited to um, have with us today Mr. Tony Alumalu, who um, all of you have seen the Arabia 500, which was, has been a huge part of this conference. Um, and we're very grateful to the GES and to the Dubai World Trade Center for incorporating us into this event. Um, All World is now excited to take our next step into the next continent with the Africa 500. And our partner on that is Mr. Alumalu and his foundation, uh, of which we're very excited. Um, and he is here today. He flew in just for this session um, to chat with you all. Um, and I would like to welcome first the moderator of that session, who is a long-time partner and friend of All World Network, Karen Dillon, who uh, is an editor at the Harvard Business Review, um, but before that was the deputy editor at Inc. Magazine. So we have literally worked together for 15 years and step by step have built 
the Inner City 100, the Arabia 500, and she continues with us on our journey into uh, new continents and the All World Network's goal of finding all of the emerging entrepreneurs in emerging markets by 2015. So without delay, I'd like to welcome Karen to the stage. Good morning. It's actually quite an honor for me to make the introduction and then conduct the conversation. This way, better. It's an honor for me to uh, make the introduction and then have the conversation, the interview with Tony, because as an editor of Harvard Business Review, I'm quite in awe of what he's managed to accomplish. The bullet points are, are brief and powerful. In 1997, he led a small group of investors to take over a distressed commercial bank in Lagos. It's now known as UBA Group and has a $2 billion market cap. It's a pan-African financial services company and a great African success story. It now operates in 20 African countries, has 10,000 employees, and $15 billion in assets. Those aren't stories we tell in Harvard Business Review every day. That path is amazing. Thank you. He left the company in 2010 to join Ayers Holdings, which is now an African-focused holding company that invests specifically in Africa. And I'm very eager to have him talk to us today about his philosophy of what's really important in investing and developing leadership in Africa. He's taken his experience, his assets, and his wisdom to the Tony Illuminu Foundation, which mentors business students across the continent and has a very interesting philosophy of what is necessary to achieve success in Africa. Please join me in having a great conversation that will be on stage and with the audience with one of the consistently cited 100 most influential Africans, Tony Illuminu. Are our microphones loud enough? Can you hear us okay? Hello, 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 hello. Okay. We're going to start the conversation on stage, but we are going to make it interactive. So I will definitely take questions from the audience after we've had a little bit of time to just get Tony's story. So I'll start here, but then I'll be turning to you for your questions as well. Tony, first I want to ask you, as a Westerner who's focused so much on Western businesses for such a long time with, in the Harvard Business Review, People don't necessarily have a handle on the opportunities in Africa. What do you think? Do we understand it properly? Is, is the, the market in the world paying proper attention? Talk to us about the opportunities you see in Africa. Uh, first, is, uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, the organizers of this event and to say that uh, we need this kind of event in Africa soon. And we are happy to be partnering with them and hope that this will start soon there. But rightly about Africa, I think so much is uh, misconstrued. People really do not understand about Africa of today. There are a lot of opportunities in Africa. You know, the GDP for Africa is growing. We've had a consistent uh, growth in Africa for about 10 years. And Africa is seen as the second fastest growing region in the world. Africa has a lot of uh, resources untapped, and Africa lacks so much in terms of, uh, or needs so much in terms of uh, investments. The current uh, GDP for Africa is uh, estimated to grow or to increase this year by over 5%. The continent has quite some positives that the rest of the world, I believe, has not uh, yet keyed into or gotten to know about. It is ambitious that as the world gets to know more about Africa, people will see more opportunities, more need to invest in Africa. I'd like to give a certain uh, example. <laughs> you know, in Africa, you have a company called MTN. MTN is the biggest telecommunication company in Africa. About uh, 10 years ago, MTN invested in Nigeria. And this investment was punished by the investors in South Africa. That is even intra-Africa. Sorry. Can I use this one? Is, will that be stronger for him, the handheld mic? OK. 
connects and should we try? Is that on? Okay. Use that one. All right. Do you want to try? Okay. Do you want to try that one? Should Okay. Is that better? Okay. So when MTN invested in Nigeria, the South African investors published MTN for investing in Nigeria. But today, less than 10 years after the investment was made, the investment was $250 million, $280 million then. Today, MTN Nigeria contributes over 60% of their gross revenue, and this is in excess of $10 billion. The profit is very high, but then, initially, they thought it was a wrong investment, the investors. This kind of story is abound everywhere in Africa. MTN is making a lot of money from Nigeria now because of two things, being at the right place at the right time. They were at the right place. Nigeria did not have a lot of uh, penetration in terms of telecommunications. And two, they did not listen to the kind of stereotypes that we usually talk about Nigeria in coming to invest in Nigeria. So I, what I would like to say to the world is, you have a lot of opportunities to invest in Africa. The market is full of uh, opportunities for people who can take the risk. And not necessarily the kind of risk that is uh, written about, but the risk of, you know, we'll talk about, about what it takes to invest in Africa. In uh, Africa also, we have uh, the Pan-African institution that we have been associated with, started small, and today has grown to become a major financial services group in Africa. It's only in Africa you see this kind of opportunity. So the story is, what we hear and read in the papers about Africa is not quite real compared to what actually obtains in Africa. People should take advantage of these opportunities. Can I just interrupt you to ask you to illustrate that a, a little bit more? I recently interviewed Mo Ibrahim, who built Celtel, which is one of the biggest success stories in Africa. And he floored me by telling a story that when he was trying to get major Western telecoms companies to invest in Africa and to take advantage of some of the inexpensive or free opportunities to build cellular networks, he was particularly interested in going after a contract in Uganda. And a director of a major Western telecom company said, Uganda, you know, Idi Amin, we don't want to do business with Idi Amin. Idi Amin has been gone for a decade at that time. It, it, was, it, was, it was nuts to Mo, who then proceeded to build it on his own. I'm curious what you think are the Western uh, misconceptions that are really getting in the way of people taking advantage of the opportunities that you talk about. The misconception is there, and uh, I think for those who are able to see beyond the misconception and able to look at the opportunities that actually exist on ground, they take good advantage of it. We have in the United Bank of Africa a bank I'm, I was associated with in building. Initially, we wanted when we started, we were looking for less than twenty billion dollars, uh, twenty million dollars for investment, but we were not able to find uh, from outside Africa or outside Nigeria. We raised the money through certain uh, market uh, initiatives like debt uh, equity swap. And today, we talked about the bank having capital, uh, market capitalization of $2 billion. And you have people from all over the world now wanting to invest in the company. The message is, what you hear out there is not what is actually the reality on ground in today's Africa. There's more political stability. The macroeconomic environment in Africa has changed totally. The, the investment climate has improved tremendously. So let us not continue to see Africa today the way we used to see it 20, 25 years ago. Things have changed significantly. Do you have uh, words of advice for people interested in taking advantage of the opportunity to, to start to get their toe in the water to understanding those opportunities? Actually, I would say that the way Africa used to be characterized as a continent that is in want of aid, donor funds, I know, is, is changing. What Africa needs today is investments. And the kind of investments, looking at long-term investment that can create real value. So those who, both Africans and those seeking to invest in Africa, should embrace investments that can create both economic wealth and also social wealth. I'd like to say that there are so many areas to look at in investing in Africa. 
a company I'm associated with, the Air Zodians Group, is an investment management company in Africa. We have interest in financial services, healthcare, hospitality, energy, and agriculture. So if you take agriculture, for instance, today in Africa, Africa has the most underutilized arable land in the world. And if we were to even increase the yield on this, on this land to global average, you would see Africa playing a key role in one, addressing food security in Africa, two, addressing global food security, and most importantly, also helping to energize and create wealth at the lo uh, local levels. So there's opportunity in that space. If you go to also agri-processing, agri-processing, most of the food consumption, processed food consumption in Africa are imported. Now, if you were, if you, if you're, be it in the area of starch, cassava starch, tomato paste, or even in the area of juice concentrate, an area we have been associated with, there are a lot of opportunities in that space. So again, that area calls for people who are interested in agri-processing. If you do invest in agri-processing in Africa, the consumption is there, the market is huge. As you make money, you also touch the lives of uh, the African people. If you go to the area of financial services, a lot of uh, unbanked Africans, the population is growing. No more than 30% of Africans have bank accounts. So you have a continent of a billion, million, a billion people. No more than 30% have access to have a bank account. So there's huge opportunity in that area. You have opportunity for payment to facilitate payments across the Africa. Even insurance, a lot of Africans are insured. So there's still huge opportunities there. If you go to real estate, housing deficit, uh, deficit in Africa, the opportunities in that area. So they're quite opportunity. Then if you go to oil and gas sector, the energy sector, power is important. Infrastructure, power infrastructure is lacking. And so that is an opportunity for people who want to invest in Africa to invest in. And it's even the area of oil and gas. Africa is a major importer of refined petroleum products. We have, we produce crude oil but we do not refine this product. So again, it's a huge market for people who are interested in going to processing of, of uh, petrochemicals or refined products. So there's quite a lot of opportunity. But what you need, you need to first identify good local partners. You know, the time has changed. It's not just about you coming to invest alone. It's nice to identify good African local partners who can, who can assist you. To, to by way of investment and also by way of bringing local knowledge and know-how so that it becomes a, a, shared, um, a shared prosperity for the investor and for the African uh, partner. Now you're mentioning Africa in one word, but it's really a complex, complex continent with many countries. You specifically in your own bank made a point of creating a pan-African company. Talk to us about, is that important? Is Pan-African important as opposed to one or two countries being identified as your market? And what are the challenges of doing that? No, I think uh, for us, I'd like to give our own example. Why did we decide to grow the Pan-African institution that we created? We believe that Africa is a huge marketplace and, there's no, and the cultural similarities are huge. The people behave about the same way. The market is in need of same type of products and services. And so having acquired capacity in one market, that is Nigeria, we felt it was appropriate to leverage the capacity we've acquired, we've acquired in Nigeria across Africa. That was one of the things that drew our expansion in or the building of a Pan-African institution. But basically, Africa has the geographies in Africa, different setting the African leaders would like to see an integrated African economy, and we believe that the private sector has a role to play in getting this done. So that was one of the reasons we said, if payment system can be facilitated across Africa, it will assist tremendously in achieving that economic integration objective. So I would say that building a pan-African institution, the experience and even the benefits that we see today, quite, quite enormous. We have helped, for instance, some countries open up their borders to others. We've helped see some African countries uh, liberalize their economies as a result of practices in some countries that were exported to others. So basically, the Pan-African experience was very useful. You've coined a term, Afro-capitalism. Did I have it right? Afro-capitalism. 
Explain what you mean by that and, and why that is a Pan-African uh, critical goal. Having run UBA, UBA, the bank we took over, or we took from a distressed institution to a Pan-African institution, we started to observe certain patterns. One, we started with small capital, and the small capital, we started with small capital, we started with a small number of staff, less than 100 staff initially. Today, during the introduction, we said 10,000. We actually recruit over 20, we have over 25,000 staff across Africa. We have, uh, so we've seen certain patterns. We try, we, 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 we try to democratize banking, to take banking services to everyone that needed to, most of the places we operated in. So putting all of this together, employment, 25,000 people starting with 100 to market cap today of about $2 billion starting with less than $10 million. Three, helping to facilitate or creating, succeeding in creating a payment platform and engine across Africa. And seeing how we've been able to facilitate trade and able to support SMEs. So started thinking that there's a pattern here that's emerging. A pattern of even though we set out to make profit, but we ended up also helping in so many other ways. So we started to think that the future of Africa actually could be in private sector's commitment to making long-term investments that, that create both economic prosperity and social wealth. Because if initially, if we did not start the bank when we did with the small capital, with a small number of people, Today, maybe we'll not have been able to create 25,000 jobs. Those who would have been looking for a job today, we'll not have been able to create the kind of, we operate, we have over 1,000 branches across Africa, and each of these properties you let from people, you, you, you support their, their economic activities, we lend money to people, we, we help to inculcate the savings culture in people. So we can also see so many things. And if we were like we operated with a private equity mindset of invest three years exit, we might not have been able to create the kind of empire we created today. So to us, the pattern we saw that emerged was a pattern of a group, a private sector group that has helped the economic development in Africa somewhat, whilst making profit, also trying to address some social challenges, and at the same time, uh, no, achieving this because of long-term investment. So to us. We started to think that Africa could really become more developed and much more transformed if we had more entrepreneurs, more private sector people who are committed to, to, to investing and investing long term. And these investors need not be Africans alone. It could be African investors. It could also be foreign investors in seeking interest in Africa. But what is important is we like through this concept of African capitalism to encourage African entrepreneurs and successful business people to also invest locally. Because as they say, charity must start from home. If you invest locally that, and your foreign associates see that you're making profit from your local investment, it will only attract them to come and invest more on your continent. So in the North Year, the concept of African capitalism is private sector commitment to the economic development of Africa through long-term investment that create economic wealth and social economic prosperity and social wealth. So it's in a way, it's what Michael Porter would call the shared value, so right. bringing it, putting it together, and not using short-term money, but maybe patient capital, long-term investments, investing and having a long-term focus on investment, and which is another advice I will have, because you asked a question before, what advice would I have for people who, who might be seeking interest to invest in Africa? The, in, the key success factor will be to think long term and not think short term. Because at times it takes medium to long term for you to actually extract real value from those investments. Well, that's easy for you to say because you've successfully done that. Although your time frame isn't all that long. You built your bank pretty quickly. But talk. let's go back to your own experience. It, it's easy to say in hindsight that you need to be patient and grow slowly. How did you actually do that? I mean, how did you actually build brick by brick to to practice what you're preaching now? As I said, it's, um, first, we, when we started in 1997, we had a three-tier strategic intent. But in all of this, we were driven by the long term. 
our investment philosophy forgot everything was long term. We want to invest where, in fact, in 1997, we had planned in our third tier intent where we would like the institution to be at. And we worked seriously towards it. So first intent was we wanted to turn around the distressed bank that we acquired. Second intent was we'd like to make it one of the top 10 banks in the country. And third intent was we wanted to be one of the top three banks in the country. And we achieved all of this. So first, we were able to turn around the bank quickly under three years, working with the human capital, the kind of people we assembled together. And going through, again, a time we go in a different direction. People were interested in banking only the corporate accounts. And we said, let us democratize banking. A lot of people don't have access to banking. And let us take banking to where banks never existed, or banking facilities never existed. And this helped us to grow very quickly. Again, there we saw shared value in practice. Because as we took banking business to the communities that didn't have banking services, they grew. And as they grew, we even grew bigger. So it was shared prosperity for, for, for all of us. So the second intent to become one of the top 10 banks, we achieved that quickly under five, six years. And the third intent to become one of the top three banks, we achieved that, we acquired, uh, we grew the bank to a certain level, fifth largest in the country, and we acquired the third largest bank. Merging the two, we created the biggest bank in Sub-Saharan Africa at the time, and ex-South Africa. So yes, we have seen, we've seen uh, this, uh, this, this, this bank grew very quickly, and it's possible to replicate this in other areas. What MTN did in Nigeria can be replicated also by, in other sectors, by other businesses. And as I said before, there are quite a lot of low-hanging fruits in different sectors of the Nigerian African economy. Did you make any mistakes along the way? Of in course. America, we have of a great course. term, I want to do over. I want to do it over. What, <laughs> what, what was your biggest mistake, or what would you do over if you could? We made quite some mistakes, not just one, but I would say that these mistakes were not uh, mistakes that could derail us from the long-term focus. And that's why it's good in business to keep the, you know, to keep, stay focused, have a long-term view, and stay the course. If you have short-term views, when you have certain distractions, it could easily take you off. But in the long run, you correct all the distractions, you learn from the distractions, and you make a, a big, uh, create a bigger institution. So we did make quite some, some but they were nothing significant to affect us, to derail us from, from the chosen, from the path that we chose to go. How did you change as a leader from the beginning of your journey, 1997, to when you could look back and actually set up your own foundation to help others? How did you personally evolve as a leader? First is, uh, first, I think I was extremely transformational in business. You know, we were very young, we wanted to conquer the world, and so we applied a lot of energy into achieving, into doing this. And interestingly, you know, as John Cotter would say in the theory of change management, as we meet short-term successes, you know, we have a long-term plan, but with milestones. So as we accomplish different milestones, we got further energized and encouraged, and we had more confidence in ourselves that we can even do more things. So because we turned around this band, we said we we'll achieve this in first tier intent. In four years, we achieved it. Under three years, we said we we'll achieved the second tier intent of becoming one of the ten. Then in the country, we had over 100 banks. We achieved it. The third one was not too difficult for us to accomplish. And when we accomplished that, we said, okay, time to reset. Let's what next? We said time to now grow. We changed our, our, our strategic intent. We now had the first one was now to become the biggest and dominant bank in Nigeria. And second one was to become one of the leading banks in Africa. And the third one was to have the glo global footprint. Where how far have we gone? How far did we go? We accomplished this also because we grew in terms of market size in Nigeria to lead. We also, in Africa, we cr created a Pan-African institution with presence in 19 African countries. And across the world, we are present today in London, New York, and, and in Paris. So we will say we achieved most of So all of this kind of shaped our leadership style, our leadership capabilities, our belief in ourselves. And then when uh, I retired from banking uh, three years ago, I, I did two things. First was um, I founded the Tony Elumelu Foundation, which is, um, I'll talk about briefly, but then the for-profit side, the 
family office that has responsibility for managing existing assets, proprietary assets, as well as making new investments in key sectors of uh, the African economy. Not just for profit now, but yes, profit is given, but also we invest in areas and sectors that have catalytic impact that can help the African economy transform. And again, hence the concept of African capitalism, which came from the ideas we captured in our working life and trying to see how we can apply all of this in making society, in creating wealth for ourselves and also helping to address some of the social issues that Africa as a continent has. Now, the for pro not for profit, the Tony Elvelu Foundation, again, looking at ourselves, our humble past, how we started, you know, and thinking that, you know, if Africa, if we could create more of us in Africa, and, you know, Africa could truly really become a much more transformed uh, continent. I thought the best thing to do was um, to set up a foundation that will actually help to create more entrepreneurs and business leaders across Africa. I was born and bred in Africa, born, bred, worked, every school, everything in Africa. Later in life, yes, we got one or two educational uh, exposures from outside Africa, but the foundation of who we are today it was actually laid in Africa, and I thought, Across Africa, if you look at the demographics, we have a strong population, a billion people, uh, less than about 50% um, is less than 30 years old. What is the future for these people? What kind of leaders we want to make of these people? How can these leaders even transform Africa, both in public and private sector, if they had the right training, the right exposure, and the right networking platforms? And so all of this led to the funding of Tunil Melu Foundation to focus primarily on creating a much more competitive environment for the private sector in Africa, leveraging leadership, business entrepreneurship, creating more of these people, realizing that if you have entrepreneurs and good business leaders, but the operating environment is not good, they can't do so much. So for us, it's business, uh, create uh, entrepreneurs, business leaders, and work with government and other foreign agencies to create a much more competitive African economy that will make people succeed. Let me, I want to ask you about both parts of the, 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 the investment and the foundation, but let me ask you about the foundation first. What, you are trying to really shape the next generation of African business leaders, or leaders, period. It's, it's critical that this generation sort of does something magnificent. And I'm just curious, what's your philosophy? What's the goal of how you're trying to shape those, those young leaders in a way that you probably learned on the job over, over your years? What's the focus? You know, there are a couple of things we, we're trying to do. So first is the kind of partnership we have with All World, All World uh, 500. We're trying to, to us, it's All World 50 Nigeria, All World 50, 500 Africa. We think that young and upcoming entrepreneurs need a lot of things to succeed. We have some of these that helped us also in succeeding. They need platform. They need a kind of uh, awareness economics. They need, they, need, they, need to, they need access to capital, the right kind of capital, by the way, not just capital. They need, they need um, to interact with the rest of the world. So that is one of the things we're doing. We also have the mentoring program where I have mentoring uh, Mentoring, um, I personally mentor upcoming African entrepreneurs and leaders through various things we have put in place. We have also what we call the African Market Internship Program, where we go get leaders or MBA graduates from across the world to work with uh, African uh, business uh, entrepreneurs. Like the All World 50, Nigeria 50, we are developing. We we'll get these MBA students. So we'll do 10-week program, internship program with them, pick some of the challenging leadership issues they have, help provide solution, and come back, seminar on them, prepare case studies that we use to actually teach and, and make available to other aspiring African entrepreneurs. This is part of, part of what, what we do. We, most importantly, we try to do what we call impact investment. We, we support some of these aspiring entrepreneurs with some seed capital, some funds to help their, their business. When we give this money, we don't give the money as charity. We give to them, the, but we don't ask for interest either. We give this money to them by way of equity investment, but we do not have controlling interest. We like entrepreneurs to be on top of their ideas and their businesses. But 
we want them to we want them to we'll support them, we we'll capacitize them so that they can operate in more successful businesses. And for each phase of their growth path, we we'll try to see what they need so we can capacitize them alongside. Some need good reporting standards, good governance standards, so we we'll try to support that. So yes, we we're doing quite a lot in this space to shape them. What makes for a great mentee, someone you're mentoring? What kind of people are going to be the most successful from your guidance? What do you look for in someone who has potential but not experience? You know, quite a number of things I tell them. I, I won't just say one, I just list a few of them. So first is I, you, you have to, it seems simple. Uh, people, today people say, look at it, interpret different. But I like people who are quite, um, hardworking and energetic. In some books or some lit modern uh, literature, they will tell you, you don't have to be hardworking. You don't need to work smart, no. For me, you have to work smart. You also have to also work, uh, work hard. So I like to look out for that. I like people who are very focused, because in life and in business and in strategy, you must have trade-offs. You know, you need to, if you dabble into everything, you end up doing nothing well. So I like people just single focus. This is your focus and give it attention. You always have challenges, like you asked me, along the line. But if you stay the course, if you've done your analysis very well in going to a certain area and you stay the course, chances are you will definitely succeed. So I like that in, in people. I like, um, it depends the stages. You know, there are some people who are moving from medium scale to last national level, last scale. Such people, I give them different advice. Governance, structure, succession, ability, also very important. But for all, what I think is most important, two most important, energy and stay in the long course, ability to stay focused. You know, define your, don't have short-term goals, have long-term goals and work towards your long-term goals. In the investment part of your business, both in the people you just talked about, but in the actual investments, you think it's critical that uh, African companies grow from African leadership, not from Western leadership being parachuted into show them how it's done. Talk a little bit more about that. I think uh, leadership is same, no coloration, whether African leadership or foreign leadership. Uh, but what is important is uh, a leader must be able to situate his leadership uh, uh, abilities and managerial capabilities in the context of your operating environment so that you're properly, you know, so you know, there are various things, certain things that are different from one region to the other in terms of culture, in terms of social values, and certain things. So the key thing is the same thing that propels someone to want to succeed in America and Japan propels someone also want to succeed in Nigeria or Africa. But there are certain nuances, certain things you need to clean up a bit, adapt. So ability to adapt is very important. But largely, I would say that, you know, today, for those seeking to invest in, in, in entrepreneurs, investors seeking to invest in Africa, my advice would be one, they think long term in terms of the investment. Two is that they seek local partners, the kind of, today we have emerging African private sector people who are quite different from what we used to have before. In the past, you had um, agents, not partners. Agents, so you do business, you help me do business, I pay you a certain commission. But now it's changed. You have today enlightened and also resourceful African entrepreneurs and business people. What they seek is partnership and not, uh, and not this. Another advice, not just for the investing uh, global public, but more for also the donor agencies and the foreign governments seeking to engage or to help build Africa. Africa, as I said before, is no longer a continent that is in. Yes, some people say they want aid, but aid we have seen does not actually lead to long-term sustainable development. So what Africa needs today is long-term investment. Let's, let's use the private sector as the engine for driving the new Africa, the new transformation of Africa. So I would say there are, there are things to do to succeed in Africa, but issue of leadership, same everywhere. Seek uh, local partners. Go to at, and most times also be ready to ha allow the locals lead you. We recently did a power acquired a power plant in Nigeria, and we have four technical partners from across the world. And it's these people are led by by local investors. That is a new kind of uh, new kind of uh, investment uh, partnership uh, 
regime that the Africa is beginning to witness. When you talk about long term, what do you mean? How long is long term? I define long term from my own perspective. You know, long term for me, if you so if you're a foreign investor, you want to come to Africa to make investments. So let's look at the petrochemical sector or the refinery sector, for instance. You know, I don't. It won't take you fertilizer refinery. It will take you almost three to five years to build, and to break even might take you another three to five years. They start making profits. So anything short of 10, 15 years, I don't think is, uh, in my viewpoint, it's not, it's not, if you want to do commodity trading in Africa, yes. But if you are thinking of adding real value, uh, long-term investment and upwards of 15 years more like it. And by the way, I think that the commodity trading era and for Africa is almost coming to an end because most, some young Africans are beginning to look into some areas that we, we lacked seriously in the past. If you look at, uh, you know, today, I said, even me, I said it here not long ago, that Africa is growing in terms of GDP expansion, second fastest growing region in the world. But someone might ask, is it an all-inclusive growth? It's not. Why is it not inclusive? Because it's kind of, uh, we, we, it's exploitative type of growth. We have, we produce uh, commodities, we ship the commodities abroad, they are processed abroad, no value added in the chain locally, and this, they are refined and sent back to Africa for consumption. But right now, a few people are coming to that processing chain. So as we, if things continue like this, and as more Africans become African capitalists, begin to invest locally on the continent, begin to look at long-term investment, begin to look at investment that add economic wealth and social wealth, then you begin to see that reverse. And so maybe there won't be much to export again by our commodities. So it's sort of a generation, you know, you need a generation to, to have the long-term payoff. I think the, the, this current generation of African private sector leaders are seeing things differently because one, we, we are not, we are not um, freedom fighters. We are fairly well-educated. We, there's some, we, we have moved on from where our parents stopped and the way we look at the world is quite different. So. We are a lot more long-term programs. Most of us are no longer fourth-generation people. You're like second-generation, third-generation. So, you know, what defines your values today and you know, the, the essential uh, human uh, needs are beginning to change. So now you want to, it's more of impact. How can we help the continent transform? What can we do to transform the continent to make Africa become truly um, a successful frontier economic block and not just in the last frontier forever? You, uh, you are one of the few two-syllable names that are really known internationally for being an African business leader. There are relatively few African business leaders who are, who are that well-known. There are many African political leaders who are very well-known. What is the challenge for your, you and your peers? What, what, what job must you now do to, to take that leadership and broaden it to the next generation? I think first for, for me, and that's part of what we preach, is um, we need to have more people come into this space. You know, so we don't want to be champions alone. You know, Africa has indeed honestly quite a, a number of successful and succeeding entrepreneurs and private sector people. And we need to change our terms of engagement. We need to change the way we operate. We need to begin to change our value system. And so what you see happening for us, we call ourselves a 21st century uh, philanthropy that is interested in catalyzing not just economic transformation, but through private sector investment and through encouraging people who, and through encouraging the economy of the private sector. We also want to encourage successful Africans to come into philanthropy world. And so this coming year, next year, we're going to, in conjunction with the Global Philanthropy Forum, we're going to set up, uh, organize an African-wide philanthropy forum for philanthropists and not just for NGOs, just for philanthropists. So we begin to meet and engage and formulate a development agenda from within, from Africa, and that forms the basis for engagement with the rest of the world to say, okay, it's not just enough to say, we want to provide money for malaria if we want to give aid. But you know, you need to define in context. Okay, so what is a broad continental aspirations in these following areas, maybe healthcare area. How do we proceed in this healthcare area? What do we do first stage, second stage, third stage? 
quite a lot. So we, for for few of us who are out there now, we are trying some of. So if you, the Tony Elmelo Foundation also, we are trying, for instance, to set up. We have actually through the government in Nigeria sent to the legislative house. Uh, no, sent to the Attorney General, which is going to the legislature now, a national philanthropy bill, so that there's style to this philanthropy also. If we succeed in Nigeria, we intend to also replicate that across Africa. We are working with various governments to set up the National Competitiveness Council in each country so that we can begin to monitor and, and have peer kind of pressure within, a review from within to ensure that countries become more competitive in uh, both the World Bank uh, ease of doing business rating and the what they coming for from competitiveness rating. So for a few of us who are there is to encourage others to come in, encourage others to, 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 to come to that space, encourage others to begin to embrace investing locally. Most of our parents never invested, were not interested in investing locally. They were more interested in saving money abroad. And so, you know, the whole thing is if you are resourceful, pick any sector, make long-term investment, create employment, also make money while you're creating employment, help local communities, touch lives while you're making money. It's better that way than keeping your money in the bank accounts and you know, abroad. So those are quite uh, an interesting uh, uh, phase we're going through as philanthropists and as business people in Africa now. What's the biggest challenge still? What is the you know, number one on the list? You talked about all the problems and all the challenges. What's one and two, maybe? <laughs> the biggest problem is these competitiveness factors. Yeah. You know, so for the private sector to play a truly catalytic role in the economic development of Africa, or transformation of Africa, you need to have the enabling environment. We do not yet have the level. It has we've made progress in the past five, ten years. In fact, past five years in particular, we have made progress as a continent. But there's so much more to do. So if we can unleash, just set the right environment, it's amazing what can come out of Africa. So and that is where the pub public sector, the private sector must engage, and also our foreign foreign partners, as in foreign government that have the clout to help influence our governments. We need to all engage to make sure that the right business environment is created. If you look at ECO, we say we don't have, uh, we have so much land in Africa that is not monetized because of the tightening laws, the foreclosure laws, the you know, Land Use Act, etc. Let's change some of these things. You know, some even utilities that we need as a, as a continent, some of the policies, extra policies we have affect the attractiveness of this sector to the private sector. Let's change this. So for me, it's more the enabling environment than any other issue. I know you're very excited about the partnership with All World and the opportunity to bring African countries to that global stage. Why, why does that matter? Why does it matter that we start seeing who the fastest growing businesses are in Africa? What, what will that do to what you've just said is so important? There are so many reasons. One is, you know, Personally, I am a very competitive person. <laughs> and, I, and I think it's very good for aspiring entrepreneurs, businesses to you know, let them compete. You know, it helps. So if you don't make it this time to the top 50, you, your next aspiration should be, what does it take to make it to top 50? Okay, good financial reporting stand, good governance st structure, good, you know, certain things, you get all of them, then you begin. That process. Is, is, is very good for aspiring or for entrepreneurs, for people who want to grow from small to big and from big to bigger. So I think it's very good. Also quite important is, you know, the more you get organized, the more you have access to the kind of capital you need to grow your business. And most importantly, even though it seems little, is the networking opportunity, sit like forum like, like this, you talk to someone from Uganda, do you share this kind of experience, do you have this kind of experience, what does it happen? You talk to someone from uh, Lebanon, someone from India, it's quite, uh, you know, so you build your own network and you also hear from others what they go through and you also listen to, you know, experts talk about people, academic experts and also real practitioners talk about experiences. It has a way of helping you get better. So I think that, uh, the all world is a great experience for us, a great partnership, because it also, for us as a foundation, it helps us because of our intent to help grow small to medium 
scale business, we take them from small, in fact, from one man business to small business, from small to medium, medium to large scale, and large to maybe a continental player, is very important because this is like a safety mechanism. It helps us to capture many of them. And so next year, for instance, the, the Army program, the African Market Internship program, where we get foreign, we get MBA students from within Africa and the rest of the world to work with host businesses. We will just go to the, uh, the Nigeria 50 and pair them up with those. So to us, it's a wonderful uh, partnership. And we think that we're looking forward to expanding it across Africa too, so that we get the all world 500, Africa 500, and that will provide. A, and for people who want to engage, you know, with the Africa, they say, okay, what is the criteria, or what are the criteria? What criteria do we want to use as a eligibility process for knowing those to engage with in Africa? If you have all world five, uh, Africa 500 or Nigeria 50, you know the top fairly well-run organizations that you can even support and capacitize. I do think people in this room can relate to the competitive instinct. I can tell you from my days at Inc. Magazine, which is the leading magazine for entrepreneurs in America, we had the Inc. 500, a very similar list in the early days. And there were lots of little companies that showed their ambition that made that list, including one known as Microsoft, was one of the first names on the Inc. 500 list. So something about getting that recognition and being hungry and competitive enough, I do think is extremely valuable, you know, sort of on the global stage. I'd love to give the audience some time for questions, and we can keep talking as well, but uh, shall we take some questions from the audience? I need to get a mic to you. If you could just uh, introduce yourself briefly before you say your questions so that we can start some networking. Tony, uh, thanks for coming, first of all. I'm from, uh, my name is Behrad, I'm from Washington, D.C. I work with an investment advisory firm and we're currently operating in Afghanistan. Um, so Afghanistan has been compared to, Afghanistan now has been compared to Africa 10 plus years ago. And just as an example, um, you know, some of the telecom operators moving in now, like MTN has established a 3G network there, and you have Etisalat uh, from here in the UAE. So that was the intro. My question is, um, what were some, if you can walk us through some of the key changes that took place in Africa as it moved from... Uh, sort of an area where investors did not want to invest to where it is now, which is you know, clearly a viable uh, emerging market investment opportunity. Should I, I'll repeat the question, I think for the audience, I think I follow your question. You do some work in Afghanistan and people see Afghanistan as a market that's perhaps 10 years behind where Africa is now. And so looking ahead, he's wondering what were some of the key milestones, key changes that happened in Africa that made it possible for such a good, vibrant, competitive opportunity? Is that, did I capture it? Yes, thank All you. All right, perfectly. In fact, this is good news. So first, your, I would take it as this, uh, an acknowledgement that Africa is truly transforming. Since you want to learn from the, you want to apply the learning experience from Africa yeah. to Afghanistan. Very, very interesting. I shall take this back home. However, there are a few things Africa has done and we can do better. So I would like to share some of this and in hope that it will also, we can replicate that in Afghanistan. First, the Africa of 10 years before was a continent characterized by farming, Poverty, extreme poverty, aid, the political assassinations, political instability, etc., military rules. Today, that has changed dramatically. I'm not saying there's no poverty in Africa, but the kind of abject type of poverty that Africa was highly associated with is changed. But the political stability that we have in Africa, I think, is a key platform for the development that is beginning to come in Africa. So I'm saying political stability, extremely important. Second point, the macroeconomic environment, the macroeconomic environment, the policies that have been put in place in Africa today by first the African countries, economies, and across the continent is beginning to, to, to is good. So macroeconomic environment and stability is very good. In my country, in Nigeria, for instance, there was a time industrialists couldn't plan long term because 
every six months, policy changes, you know, it's almost like you didn't know the direction things would go. Today, that has changed drastically, and that helps. Africa has also embarked on massive liberalization, commercialization, and privatization of state-owned enterprises. SOEs are not well run at all by government. Government don't have business running companies. They have African leadership have not realized that let us encourage the private sector to take charge here. And they've sold not just to indigenous Africans, but both to whoever, investor from anywhere in the world that wants to invest in Africa. The other one is competitiveness factors. You have seen some African countries improve tremendously. Countries like Rwanda, countries like Ghana, they have tremendously improved. Nigeria has improved marginally, but can do a lot better. And so as countries, you know, capital goes to where it's most welcome. So people will go to invest in any country that has political stability, right macroeconomic environment, and very competitive uh, operating environment for private sector to do well. And of course, to have competitiveness factors, issues like rule of law, very important, contract enforcement, respect for property rights and laws, very extremely important. So those seemingly soft issues that create believability in the country, in the system, are very important. And of course, the hard issues like uh, telecommunications, internet broadband, the railway system, transportation system, power, et cetera. They're all very, very important. So yes, it's interesting to know that Africa is gradually becoming a world model for, for development. Thanks. Hi, hi Tony. Uh, Hamdi Asman, uh, former uh, CEO for FedEx for Africa, Middle East, and Indian subcontinent, and uh, retired after 34 years. Looking into Africa right now, I'd like to know your uh, view on the intra-Africa. Everyone is looking from Africa from the outside or from the inside out. I want to know about the intra-Africa. What's your view in terms of how long it's going to take and what is it that you think it is the uh, opportunist that we can all benefit from in intra-Africa? No, I think, uh, you know, for intra-Africa economic growth or integration development, three things must happen. First is transportation, ease of transportation, the movement of goods within the continent. Two is movement of personnel people. And three is movement of money, payment system. So this economic, regional economic integration is usually built on these three platforms. So let's look at Africa. So ease of movement of people within Africa, still not strong. Okay, but what I think African leaders have adopted that is encouraging is, let's begin to look at several unions. So East African Union, West African Union, Central African Union. So let's even get free movement of goods and people within these areas, and that can help us as a platform for even looking at the whole, the entire continent. In the area of uh, transportation of people, people movement, I'm uh, sorry, movement of goods, we have been talking about Saharan um, railways cutting across uh, regions. We need to have this. We need to make sure that our border system is not so difficult for companies to, for, for for, for transportation of goods across our borders. In terms of payment, I think, even if I say so myself, as a continent, we've done very well, and thanks to United Bank for Africa, we have done very well that before now, if you had your children schooling in some part of Africa, like Nigerians who were school, who school in Ghana or Kenya and co, you have to go through New York to move dollar, or Paris to move um, uh, France, uh, French, but now, all of that is gone. You can't walk into a bank in, say, Nigeria, and your son can apply from uh, withdraw from his or her ATM in Kenya or in uh, Tanzania. Again, that underscores the role of private sector in economic, in catalyzing economic growth within uh, Africa. But another thing to look at is on this issue of intra-Africa um, uh, economic integration is investments and trade. So let me take the two of them. For trade. It would be a tall order to see trade go beyond the current 10%. The reason is simple. If Nigeria produces, what do we produce in Africa? We are more like commodity economies at this point in time. 
And so the commodities we produce, be agri commodities, we don't have the processing facility in, within Africa. And what I want to consume is not raw cocoa. I want to consume the derivatives and the finished products from cocoa. Take uh, petroleum, uh, petroleum uh, crude oil. Nigeria is a major producer of crude oil, yet Nigeria is one of the world's biggest importer of, importers of um, yeah, petroleum products because we lack the ability to process. So Nigeria cannot increase its trade volume in Africa because Nigeria cannot sell. So what Ghana wants from Nigeria is not crude oil per se, but they want finished products. If Nigeria had the capability to process uh, crude oil products and put, turn them to refined petroleum products, Ghana will buy. And now you begin to see trade between Nigeria and Ghana go up. You see trade between Nigeria and other countries go up. So this is not really happening. Until, as Africans, or as a continent, we begin to, to we acquire the expertise to set up processing plants that will process the commodities we have, the raw material, the agri pro commodity, etc. It will remain a tall order. So we can always have conferences to talk about inter Africa trade not growing, we can help it. Let's look at investments. Intra Africa investment is rising. So if you look at, again, a United Bank for Africa, a Nigerian company at some point in time, today operating 19 African countries, it's done that, so it's encouraging investment. You have like Dangote Group, a cement manufacturing company in Nigeria also, setting up plants in some other African countries, is helping. And the same way, MTN, a South African telecommunication company coming to Nigeria, going to Ghana, going to Liberia and other countries, is helping. So I see a lot, and so all of these things make me believe in this concept of Africa capitalism, that we, no one but us and ourselves, can actually help to develop Africa, either by making investments ourselves or by pointing and leading the way for others to follow us so that we can actually make investments that Africa truly needs to, for both prosperity and in addressing social problems that we also have as a continent. Very good question, by the way. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question. We'll do two. We'll do two. We'll do that one. Hello, uh, I'm Gilles Ajavon, um, finalist of GSTE competition. Congratulations. And thank you. Uh, well, my question is how uh, young entrepreneurs like me and my team, like we are really young, just coming out of school. I personally uh, went to school in Ghana, even though my first language was French. And now, how can we work hand in hand with um, our role model from Africa, as a, not only as a network for mentorship or finance, but in a way of not marketing and expansion? Because I believe, I may have a younger vision for um, how Africa should work, but I believe that the only way we can really achieve a big growth in Africa should be hand in hand. You know, in a way that expansion and finances and marketing should be a total network. So how can we achieve that with our role models, such as uh, you, for example? <laughs> Francis, uh, I must congratulate you for making it to this level. So uh, well done. Thank you very much. Well done. Where's your business, Ghana? No, my business is in Senegal. Okay. I wanted to launch it in Ghana when I was a student in Kenya UST. But then uh, there was one of the problem, visa processing, because you cannot use that currency on visa or paper. And uh, as I did computer science, I lacked some knowledge in management, accounting, laws. So I moved to Senegal, which was, which actually, I'm actually doing another bachelor uh, that's supposed to finish in January in finance, management, and law. I think, uh, just like the last question that was asked about Africa, integration within Africa and what's impeding it, you know, visa, visa was an issue, getting a, procuring a visa. But on the issue of uh, marketing, I think uh, we, we platforms such as this, again, like I was talking about the All War 500, uh, Africa 500, we're trying to create platforms, you know, to, to platforms for these networking platforms. One, two is we try to, we should as role models make ourselves accessible and available to advise people. So for instance, what I do once a month, 
once a month, 12 to 1 p.m. every Saturday. I tweet. I tweet on mentoring and leadership. I go online and I, I answer questions and people ask questions. I tweet because I believe that, you know, for me, legacy starts from replicating ourselves. I would like to die a man that was able to create maybe a thousand more to Nelly Melus. So I understand what you're talking about. I relate to it. You're on the right track. Being in this kind of forum is actually being on the right track. And so we shall fiscal platform to interact and virtual platform to also communicate and interact. So and if, if you don't follow him too. already, you better follow him in two or three minutes from now on Twitter. <laughs> and have some, can, can people, I will, I'll ask him that question. Can people ask you questions on, when, you, when you do that one hour of tweeting, mentoring? Can they ask you questions and get answers in real oh, time? Oh yeah, that's what I said. They yeah, ask questions. In fact, they, in fact, they ask so, many, so much that at times what I do yeah. within the one hour, after the one hour, I take the other question, I answer them during the week and I send back right. you know, to the system. They do ask a lot of questions. Remind him who you are when you tweet. We'll make sure, we'll put pressure on him to give you a good answer. And then the last question, thank you for waiting. We need a microphone or you can have, you can have mine. Sorry. Okay, thanks for that. My name is Shadi Batna. I'm from Potential.com and we have a platform to support entrepreneurs. And one area that I'm uh, keen on getting your feedback on is B what are the, uh, the areas where you think that Africa can leapfrog other markets in innovation without having to depend or wait for the infrastructure to be at par with other markets? And one example of that is in mobile technology, there's yeah. been a lot of innovations that have happened from Africa. So what areas like that do you see the, you know, that Africa could provide worldwide innovations in? I can't stand here and say everything. As you were speaking, I was going to talk about the, the Impesa experience in Kenya, but you ended up talking about it, uh, about it also. But also in Kenya, I think it's called Ushadin or something, where they use uh, ICT technology also to shape and monitor the electionary elections. There, there are quite a lot of things coming up in Africa, but technology is one. The, you know, in Countries or continents must specialize in their areas of competitive advantage or natural uh, endowment. One of the things we have in Africa about natural endowment is population. We have population, and not just population, we have young population. So, you know, necessity, they say, is the mother of invention. So, out of the, in this case, not relative obscurity, but out of relative uh, or determination to succeed. Africa will look back and build on its competencies, on, you know, build competencies on its abundant uh, resources. We have, we, have, uh, we have people, and these people are very, very, the young Africans, even if I say so myself, are extremely resourceful people. So I think ICT and things that go from there, the outsourcing because of the cheap, uh, in quote, labor we have in Africa. So once the bandwidth, once we have the right technology bandwidth in Africa, I believe a lot of things will go start. Once we have, and that's why I talk about the competitive factors, once we have power, electricity, a lot of things will go off from Africa. So, and I think the opportunities are truly enormous. The thing is for, for, for the African entrepreneurs and thinkers to have where to go to, to socialize their ideas and see and, and get necessary encouragement and push that will make them take off. In PESA, the story of PESA, I believe we all know, and just little amount of money change made a difference. You know, in, um, in fact, in, in Tanzania, one of the investments we made in Tanzania, Matanga Farm, we have been able to develop a new kind of potato seed that can even produce a lot more than, than, than you currently have in the world today. So there, it's fertile for a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, opportunities. Let me twist that comment, therefore, and say Africa has abundance of human capital, abundance of agri-commodities, abundance of natural commodities like minerals, etc., and Africa and arable land, Africa is a land of immense opportunities for those who have the knack for identifying opportunities and are able to exploit and capitalize on and gain 
from this. But why they do all of this? Let's do it not in a land-grabbing fashion, but let's do it in a manner that is sustainable, in a manner that encourages or helps the local communities also while we make business, uh, make profit as business uh, people and investors. Thank you. Well, that's an excellent note to leave this on. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us and your wisdom. And uh, we look forward to seeing more of the Africa 500 in the, in the years ahead. Thank you, Tony. Thank you.